Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Dave Lenahan and I'm the president and CEO of Ponce Health Sciences University and Tiber Health. And what I want to talk to you today is a model that we created to scale medical education using data analytics so that we can get more minorities into healthcare and keep our costs down. What are we doing? Oop, we skipped the slide. What we're doing is we're going to be able to use large scale data and create more doctors at an effective rate. What makes this happen and what allows conferences like this to work well is the fact that the human body is the same everywhere. Regardless of where you're on the planet, our heart has four chambers, we have a liver, we have kidneys, and that allows us to develop programs that we're discussing today. So what are some of the issues in creating or why we need a standardized health education system? In the US, we're about 100,000 doctors short from what we need right now. This problem gets magnified if we look at the entire planet. We're about 13 million, dollar, or 13 million health workers short in just a few short decades. One of the other problems, and this is, you might not have heard this, but this is one of the things that is truly striking to me, unequal access to healthcare. And I know we talk about it here in the US, but the World Bank and the World Health Organization say the number one killer of women and children in Latin America is the inability to find a healthcare worker. That's the number one killer. They can't find a doctor. And then the cost of medical education has just gone completely bonkers. The average cost to build a new medical school is about $150 million, according to Forbes. And the new school they're building down in Texas is running close to a half a billion dollars. Now, I know we can say that these are not-for-profit organizations, but the reality is those costs do get translated down to the student. And for those of you who are medical students or professors, it took me 20 years to pay off my student debt. I don't know how some of my students are actually going to be able to pay off the debt they're acquiring now. So we have to find a solution to this. The question we got to decide is what actually makes a great doctor? I'm sure a lot of us in the room think the straight A student, the kid that gets the good grades, he has to be the doctor. But I want to question that just for a second. What does make a good doctor? What about having some compassion for the patient? What about giving the patient a hug? What about this story that went viral on Facebook about an ER doctor who lost his patient and went outside and started crying? These are the doctors I want. So the question is, what makes a good doctor? Now, I wasn't going to put this slide in my deck, but I had a good friend in the UK, his name's Tom, who told me that this is actually a very big deal. I had a student commit suicide on me. I was the dean. And a student got a B in one of their clinical clerkships, couldn't tell her parents that she got a B and killed herself. The stress is too much. We have to figure out a way to bring that compassion into medical education. And as the speaker just before me, Reese, said, the lecture is crap. Standing in front of a classroom and sitting there for eight hours as a student is not a fun experience. I remember doing that. I know many of you remember doing that. Even if you're not doctors, you probably did that in your college career. So we need to find a way to change this. And this is my story of how I developed a program. And I want to say that I did this not knowing that there was a $5 billion industry out there trying to solve the same thing also. I was just trying to solve low board passage rates. We didn't have any minorities in our school. We didn't really have a lot of students supplying like you would expect to happen. And so we had to change the way we were doing this. And it started with a lecture. I teach neurosurgery, neuroanatomy, and I'm giving a lecture on the brain. And as you heard, getting students to go to medical school is very tough. Students don't go to class. These are A-types personalities. They learn on their own. They're smart kids. The class before me was biochemistry. There'd be 10 kids in it. The class after me was pharmacology. There'd be 10 kids in it. But my class. I had 150 students, every student came to my class. Kids from NYU, Columbia, they would come listen to me. I'm the, I'm the, you know, the god, right? So they're all in class and I'm speaking about this lecture, or excuse me, the blood supply to the brain. And those of you who don't know, you have three vessels that supply blood to the brain, a front, a middle, and a back. Two hours I'm lecturing about this. Everyone's nodding, you know, when you give a lecture and everyone's looking at you, you get a high, kind of exciting. No one's looking at Facebook, no one's on ESPN. So then the class, I say, all right, here's a patient, a real patient. I said, she's got some symptoms. What vessel stroked? What vessel was damaged? Front, middle, back, and I made up a fourth answer. I got 
right down the board. <laughs> which is laughing, which means it's noise. The students had no idea what the correct answer was. 80% of all strokes happen in the middle. So even if you don't know, you should guess some, some answer, right? That, that. So I got pissed and I said to the students, 5% of your grade is based on this. You gotta solve it. They solve it. I walk out of class, kind of pissed, and I'm thinking there's two things that could happen here. One, the 150 kids in this classroom are too stupid to understand a Cambridge, Edinburgh edu doctor like me, maybe. Or two, and this is really the difficult thing, and this is the difficult thing for health education. I'm no good. I get paid a lot of money. Kids come to my class, I'm entertaining, but I'm not connecting with them. I have a problem. I came up with a solution to change it. I just took a tape recorder, taped my lectures. I know it's called the flip classroom now, but at the time I didn't know. Taped my lectures and gave it to the students. Students would listen to the lecture, and I would ask them questions. That's all we did in class, is we just went through questions, clinical cases they're likely to see. I was able to cut down the classroom time, and we were able to get the students more into clinical scenarios. So here's an example of so when you look me, at the I still slide, wear the bow tie, sure the even 10 years later. Bacillus, which is right. midline, so and the nucleus canatus, which is the second thing we needed to do is we had to figure out a way to de-stress the class. Patient, uh, student committing suicide is a big deal to a dean. We all have to deal with this. It's part of, you know, part of medical education. So what we did was we came up with a solution. I think if you take anything away and you're a medical educator, this was something that I thought was very successful. We took all the kids who went to our school through the history of the school. This is uh, all the courses. Just put them in a big table. I took out all the students who failed the boards. So any student that failed the board, I pulled them out. They didn't be successful in my curriculum. Then I took out all the students who failed that individual class. I distributed that student population, so we got a nice distribution. And the students coming into that class were competing against the 10,000 students that were before them, not against the kids in the class. No more competition in the class. They were competing against others. This was the biggest hit I did at school because then the students started working together in teams to solve the questions I asked them in class. We started asking questions in class. We started getting lots of data, lots and lots of data. And then we started to develop analytics. Every question we asked the students, we decided how much worth it was. The more difficult it was, the more value it provided. The more relevant to the boards, the more value it was provided. 29 regressions. And then we tracked them, just like a stock market. They get the question right, I, I take money into their bank account, they get it wrong, I take it away, and we just track them. But here's what happened. I was able to start identifying students who started to deviate or started to wander a little bit from their normal scores. A students get A's, B students get B's. You don't very seldom see an A student drop to a C student or a C student drop up to an A student. When a student did that, when a student went from an A to a B, I would call them in my office. And I'd say, hey, Mary, you know, what's up? Nine times out of 10, the student says that cardiovascular exam was too hard. I had to let off some steam. I just couldn't keep studying. I had to, to let it go. Great. Write it in their notes. They go back. It's the one time out of 10 where a student says, and these are real things, by the way, that I've dealt with, that I know people in medical education have dealt with. I'm being abused by my husband. My child has cancer. Mom is sick back in India. Something in their life is about to stop them from graduating medical school. They get three failures, they're out. Game's up, I can't do anything about it. But if I know about it ahead of time, I can do something. We can work with that student and help them fulfill their dream. By doing this, we reduced our dropout rates from about 6 to 8% to 2%. That means 4% more students made it through our program. The analytics also allowed me a mechanism to change our admissions. We had like 2% black students in Harlem. For God's sake, we're in Harlem. By changing our admission standards, by using the analytics, I learned that the verbal score had no bearing whatsoever on how a student did in medical school. So we just got rid of it. We didn't use that as an admissions piece to our school. And our URM, our black and Hispanic ratios, went from about 3 to 4% to 30% to become one of the largest URM schools in the Northeast. And these were students all the other medical schools weren't taking. We were taking, and they were graduating. And that cultural competency, that skill set, to know what it's like to be from a community, to go back in those communities to practice, is what we were looking at in developing our patient, or excuse me, our student population. And it was highly successful. Our board passage weights went through the roof. 
because we were taking students that we knew would make it, but we knew they weren't being accepted to other medical schools. Looks like a nice linear line. This is over five years. It doesn't really go like that. And the board is a couple years worth of work in my office. So what are some of the benefits to society? We can take this curriculum and we can scale it. We can concentrate on the cultural competency aspects of healthcare. We can standardize the curriculum and verify the quality. So we can maintain the high quality while concentrating on that cultural aspect of healthcare. We can make it affordable. We can deliver this at a hundredth the cost it took to build the Texas school. It's great that we got these great buildings. You go into Northwestern in Chicago and they got the 80 foot marble ceilings and gold laced around. The That's not needed to teach students. We need 13 million more healthcare professionals on this planet. Marble on the ceiling ain't gonna fix it. All right? And we need to be able to train doctors and communities where they're needed. The benefits to the students is we can develop early warning systems to help the students know when there's a problem and catch problems before they begin. We can help with better admission standards. We can change those admission standards. For God's sake, we're supposed to be smart people. We should be able to figure out a way so that we can get more minorities into healthcare. It's what America needs. It's what the world needs. There should be a solution. We get the students willing to work together in classrooms. I didn't want to work with anybody when I was in med school. I did it on my own. We want the students to work together to get better outcomes. And for the reality is it's more fun for the teacher and it's more fun for the student to develop a system where they're working together and engaged. So I found this quite funny. Tech support, a um, little true. And then why am I doing this? My boys are gonna become doctors. Well, I'm at my older one's actually in medical school in Kansas right now. And it's important to me. We need to find a solution. We need to find a solution for the US we need to find a solution for America. We need to find a solution for the world. And it's conferences like this where we are able to go about trying to talk together and find these solutions. Thank you very much.